project today we have an extra blessing that i'll be sharing with you in a moment but before we do that if you weren't here earlier restrooms the easiest way to get to a restroom from this building this room is out that door turn around and look ladies make a sharp left gentlemen make a sharp right and i mean literally u-turns and you'll be in the restroom um we're going to leave that door open as much as we can so you can come and go through that door as need be so no need to raise your hand and ask just quietly excuse yourself and go cell phones you know where yours is right now i know where mine is but it's not in my hands it's not in my lap it's not even available to me and that's what needs to be happening now all of them away no games no TikTok, no anything just your ears and your brain paying attention and also you brought something to write with and write on i hope okay all right i think that's all of the housekeeping it's funny that she's gone any did i miss anything miss goodwin or is that are we good okay so this morning today's whole topic is going to be persuasion paper so we have a really cool speaker for you today who's going to talk to you about ethics and that's sort of that whole idea of the argument of pro versus con and I will have some more thoughts on it, but Dr. Penn Holler is with us today. He is a professor emeritus from Shenandoah University in the ethics department. Couldn't be any more qualified to speak to you today. He does work, he does teach one of our online classes for our juniors, so if you're interested in medical ethics later, sign up for the class. It's a fabulous opportunity. He has retired from that full-time gig um, and has blessed us by showing up today. So please give him your best attention and of course best behavior the only other piece of um, disruption will be Goochland's buses were running late so they will be showing up in a moment and we will filter them in accordingly at that time dr holland thank you well you better wait till the end you might change your mind so I didn't know there was something I was supposed to do. All right, so uh, we're going to think about what ethics is and and what and, and apply ethics to uh, to technology. And I first want to start just sort of thinking. Uh, very broadly, uh, what is te technology? Uh, so, chat to the per with the person next to you. Think of some examples of things you would label as technology. You don't seem to be having trouble with this. So, uh, somebody name a technology. Cell phone is technology. What else? Cars are technology. Hmm? A toaster is technology. Wow. A computer is technology. Yeah. So. Our lives are surrounded uh, by technology or technologies. Now, one of the things that we always do in, in, uh, in philosophy classes is, is define things. Uh, and, and definitions are always abstractions. So, so think about what do all these things you're labeling as technology have in common? What makes something a technology? Talk about yourselves. Come up with the def come up with the definition of technology to, to propose.
Anybody ready to propose a definition? Anybody ready to propose a definition? Yes. So everything man-made is a technology? What do you all think about that? Can you think of anything man-made that you wouldn't call a technology? <laughs> I heard somebody over here say a human being. Yeah, uh, human beings make human beings, I guess, in some strange way uh, that we'll not talk about. Um, we're not going to talk about how. Yes. Ooh, something. So, so let's add on to the previous definition. Something man-made that helps. Can we say human-made? Because women also do technology, right? Something made by humans. And what 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 was the language you used? Yeah, it helped us complete some kind of a task. I mean, it, 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 it somehow does something for us that we think needs to be done, right? Yeah, something invented that has a purpose and is useful. I, I think you're getting at uh, what, what I have... Uh, must have gone backwards. All right. The practical application of knowledge. Now, I think one of the things we haven't uh, hasn't come up yet is there's some between science and technology, isn't it? Uh, so the practical application of knowledge, especially scientific knowledge, to some specific task or problem. So we want to communicate. We want to communicate across long distances. We've developed these technologies we call telephones to enable us uh, to, commu to communicate along, uh, uh, along, across long distances. I mean, automobiles, right? We want to get from one place to the other. Automobiles are, are something we've, we've created, we've developed, we've invented um, uh, to help us solve that problem of wanting to get from one place to the other. Uh, increasingly sophisticated tools for solving human problems. I think the, the new thing I've thrown in there is increasingly sophisticated. I mean, I'm not sure 100 years ago or 200 years ago, even though there were already technologies, uh, people were, were thinking about what technology is. And I think we're thinking about it because our technology gets increasingly sophisticated, right? Um, and going back to the scientific thing, some might call technology applied science. All right, so scientific knowledge sort of by itself is nice to have. It's better to know than not know. But what really makes scientific knowledge good is when we can apply it to some, some problem uh, or, or some um, 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 concern, desire, value that we have, and we think the application of this knowledge and the invention of some technology increase uh, value uh, in our lives. Think about this for a minute. What new technology in your lifetime, okay, what new technology has had the greatest impact in your life? Uh, I'm going to ask your teachers to think about that because their answers are going to be different because we've lived a long time. Now think about that. What new technology, what something that you have now and use now that didn't exist when you were born that's changed your life? Anybody want to share a thought? What technology has changed your life, for better or for worse? 
Anybody? What's that? Smartphones? Smartphones didn't exist when you were born? I can't remember. When, when did smartphones come along? Yeah, you know, it used to be the phones just phoned. I, I, I find one of the strangest things, but I love it, uh, is you're in a conversation with somebody now, and you say, well, did the, when was the first time the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl? And so I said, oh, I think that was in 1984. And oh, I think it was 2003. What did we do? Google it. Get out our phones, our smartphones and Google it. And immediately we know. Are we better off because we know? Kind of, kind of a conversation stopper. Yeah, there we go. So. Any, any other thoughts? Smartphone? Anything else that anybody thought of in your lifetime that's made a big, big impact? Yes. E earbuds? Ear, ear pods? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I knew what he meant. I'm, I'm old, but I, I know some of this terminology. How, how does that make your life different? I mean, interesting thing, obviously. That's useful to them, but you're suggesting there's a downside, right? In some ways, they interfere uh, with, with, with. I mean, I, I'll never forget as a as a college professor uh, noticing uh, my students in the hallway outside of my class, and everybody is looking into their cell phones, and nobody's talking to each other. And I remember one time there were just uh, two young ladies sitting there. Side by side, both of them staring into their cell phones. And I said, why don't you all talk to each other? And they said, oh, we're roommates. We talk to each other all the time. So I got put in my place. So uh, some of you older folk, uh, Ms. Johnson, <laughs> what technology has changed your life? How did you answer that question? GPS. Huh. Any other of the... <laughs> yeah. That, that would be my answer, too. The personal computer, even before it was connected to the Internet, uh, it, it, I, I was writing my dissertation. You know, a Ph.D. dissertation is basically a book. And when I was first starting, I had never seen a word processor. So literally, I'm writing everything out on pads. And one of my classmates had this rudimentary word processor. And I said, ooh, i got to have one of those. And I ended up writing my dissertation on that and, and thinking the whole time, I couldn't have done this. Although millions of dissertations had been written. <laughs> uh, so obviously, it could be done. But I can't imagine doing it now. You ought, you ought to see my handwriting. I mean, I write so little, I type everything, right? Do, do any of you? Well, <laughs> they're making you write today. So I still have good handwriting, right? All right, so uh, it's interesting. I think we, we noticed that technology can have downsides, and, and it, so it serves a purpose, but it also has, has some negatives. That maybe is why we feel like we have to think about technology from a perspective of ethics. What do you think ethics is? Take, take a minute to chat with each other and let's, let's come up with a definition of ethics. It's funny, I was following a Goochland County bus down Route 6, and I was sure I was following each group. It turned off to a little middle school, and then I realized, nope, that wasn't Goochland. Welcome, Goochland.
So uh, anybody want to make a proposal? What is ethics? Yes. An individual's moral code. Yes. Now it's interesting. She said individual, and you said societal. What's that? Moral is individual, and ethics is society. Hmm. Interesting. A general what? So social agreements about what's right and wrong, and maybe we then have our individual moralities evaluated, uh, corrected, uh, challenged by society's conception of right and wrong. Any other suggestions, proposals? All right, let me show you how I define it. Why do I keep going? Uh, I define ethics as critical and systematic reflection on morality. So, you see, there's some relationship between morality uh, and ethics. I, I would also, I mean, you all have said morality is personal, ethics is social. Um, I, I think there is personal morality and social morality. Uh, so this relationship is a little tricky, so, so, but the way I think of it is, is when we think hard, critically, about our morality, we're doing ethics. So uh, I was introduced as an ethicist, as someone trained in ethics. What have I been trained to do? I've been trained to think hard, critically and systematically, about morality. Right? So for me, that's what ethics is. Now, is the question of, of what is morality or, or what, what, are, what are we reflecting on. And, and I found this helpful. The three C's. You mentioned one of them. Not the least bit surprised that you mentioned conduct or behavior. Clearly morality and ethics have to do with, with conduct and behavior. What's right, what's wrong, uh, what's permissible. Uh, uh, but I, I think it's important to recognize that our moral lives involve more than just our judgments about what's right and wrong to do. I'll bet you sometime in the last 24 hours, you've made a moral judgment about people. You have, you, or, or let's put it this way, you think of some people as basically good moral people, and some people are not so good. So my point is, we don't just evaluate discrete acts that people do. We come to think that over time, a person's acts define the person. And so it's not just acts that are right and wrong. There are people that are, are good and bad. There's some, some ethical uh, thinkers focus here. It's called character ethics. And what they worry about uh, or think about or try to make sense of is what are the traits of character that we think define a good person? Things like honesty, faithfulness, loyalty, courage, right? Those are called virtues. And their opposites are vices, right? Bad people are dishonest, undependable, cowardly, uh, Aristotle was the first philosopher to think really hard about this, and he had an interesting theory of virtue and vice. He didn't think that every virtue had an opposite vice. He thought the, uh, every virtue was the mean to extremes. So when I talked about courage, I said cowardice. So somebody that doesn't have enough courage is cowardly. What we call a person, do you, have you ever thought that somebody had too much courage? Is there such a thing as too much courage? Yeah, I mean, and if, you, if you watch war movies, a standard trope in war movies is the officer who sends his troops up the hill, even though they got no chance of taking the hill, they just kill one person. Was that Colonel Courageous? No, he's stupid, right? <laughs> or, or Aristotle had a fancier term, foolhardy. 
One of my favorites of Aristotle, I love this because it, it, it's the only place I've ever seen this word. Friendliness, he regarded as a virtue. What's it mean not to be friendly enough? What word, what word would you have for that? Standoffish. What? Mean. Well, I guess that's, a, that's an aspect of being unfriendly. Can you be too friendly? <laughs> and do you have a word for that? I'm going to give you one. What? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out whether I agree with you that an extrovert, I think I'm an extrovert, I don't think I'm too friendly. Can't you be an extrovert and not be too friendly? I don't know. Well, here, Aristotle's word, of course, it was a Greek word, but here's how it's gotten translated. Write this down. Go home and use it with your parents. They'll say, wow, that governor's school is really teaching my kids some stuff. Obsequious. Have you ever heard that word? Obsequious. Yeah. That's somebody that's too friendly. Oh, I just love your haircut. Did you get a new haircut? Oh, that's so nice. Would, hey, you want to hang out this afternoon after school? Do you know people like that? That's what Aristotle would call obsequious, right? Too friendly. How, do, how about it? Google it, Sally. Uh, o b c s l b s e q u i o u s maybe obsequious. Yeah, yeah. But 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 go home and tell your parents. Oh, that Joe I've told you about at school. He is obsequious. And either your parents are going to say, don't forget where you came from. Don't you go acting like you smarter than us, right? Or they're going to be really impressed. So, we'll see. Now, the third thing that I, uh, the other C, besides uh, uh, conduct and character, and I have trouble with this one, I, I need a C word. Uh, I, I've called it conditions. But what I mean, what most philosophers would call Values. What what things, what conditions, do we seek in our lives? Because we think our lives will be better if these things, these conditions exist in our lives. Things like health, right? Uh, maybe that's because I'm old, and so health becomes increasingly <laughs> a, a dominating value. Financial security. Quality relationships. Those are the, so the things like that are things we value or conditions that um, we think will make our lives better. Uh, now, what is what is social ethics? Again, um, within the field of ethics, we distinguish between um, uh, just ethics broadly, and then a field called social ethics. And I think what social ethics has arisen as a result of our human awareness that so much of our life is shaped by institutions, right? Why are you here today? Did all of you as individuals just decide to be here? No, you're here because you're getting educated in an institution that's created this thing called the Blue Ridge Virtual Governor School, the Blue Ridge... Virginia Governor School, right? Uh, so, so your being here is not simply a personal choice. It's the product of an institution and its policies and practices. Um, now, when we start thinking about the impact of institutions on our lives, that raises the question, how do they shape us? What kind of person do they ask us to be? The standard critiques of education in an institution is uh, that it, it values conformity. It shapes you to be, so you answer the right answers on a standardized test, right? And who are the folks that, and I know many artists uh, who are very successful in the arts struggle in school. And when, you, when they think back about why they struggle, it's, they weren't, they're not conformists, right? They're, 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 it's hard for them to be the kind of person that institutions maybe ask us to be, right? 
So, so one way to think about institutions is what kinds of persons do they shape us to be? And what goods are they directed toward? What conditions are, are they meant to address? So again, why do we have educational institutions? Because we value knowledge. We think it's better to know than to be ignorant, right? Uh, we think it's better uh, to think critically than just to accept uh, whatever information or ideas come into your head. Uh, why do we have some other institutions? Why do we have corporations, right? To efficiently produce things, right? If we just depended on individuals to make our cell phones and our cars, we probably wouldn't have cell phones and cars, right? We have institutions that have been created uh, to make money for their stockholders, uh, but to produce uh, the products we think we need. <clears throat> now, one of the uh, big things that social ethics focuses on is power. Institutions invariably uh, reflect you might say they're, they're created by particular people who have the power to create those institutions. But of course, they ask others of us to participate who maybe have less power. And whenever there are power differentials, we worry about injustice and exploitation. So that's a big topic um, in, in uh, social ethics when it comes to institutions. <clears throat> so so what, what is ethics? How does it relate to technology? And I want to start with the C word. What purposes do any particular technology serve? What, what conditions are they trying to create in our lives that somebody, maybe many of us, think makes our lives better? Our lives better? How does it promise to improve human life? And as we've already said, and how does it, in some ways, maybe undermine some things we think are good in our lives? How does the tool change us? What traits of character does it enhance, and which ones does it undermine? You know, one of the big questions, for example, about social media and all the, all the sort of technologies we have. You know, I, 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 old people argue about this all the time. Is Facebook a good thing or a bad thing? Right? Well, why do, I'm a defender. Why do I think it's a good thing? Because when I run into Sally every six weeks or two months, because of Facebook, I kind of know what's going on in her life. We don't have to sort of catch up, right? And through Facebook, I've connected to people from high school days and college days that I've lost track of. So for me, all that's good. On the other hand, these people on Facebook that I never see, but we share pictures, we call friends. <laughs> Does social media somehow undermine our conception of what, you know, does it change our conception of what friendship means in a way that's really bad for us, right? Uh, just, just an example. Or, or think about one of the things that a lot of environmentalists uh, talk about is how important it is for human beings to have a particular, a, a deep sense of connection to a place, to the people in that place, to the communities in that place, to the land and the air in that place. Many people would argue that our uh, ability to transport ourselves from one place to the other is so rapid by cars, by airplanes, however, has undermined human beings' sense of place, a sense of belonging anywhere, right? My wife and I have just moved from Madison County to Richmond in the last year. And, and one of the things I, I, I don't quite yet feel at home in Richmond, right? I, I, don't, have, I don't have the commitment to to those people, many of whom I don't even know that I run into. It used to be when I went to the grocery store, I knew everybody, right? Um, or my, my my wife would say, I only know her, I know her parents and her grandparents and her great aunts and uncles. Yeah, now I'm in a completely different different um, 
uh, because of our ability to, to move ourselves so, so quickly. Is that, has that, is that bad for us in some way, to have lost our sense of place? And then obviously, uh, what should we do and not do uh, with any particular technology we have at our disposal? Right? Uh, an airplane is a means of transportation, uh, but it, it can also become a weapon in the hands of governments with a big military budget or in the hands of terrorists, right? So what is essentially a means to get from one place to the other can have some other uses that, raises, that raise significant ethical questions. And what about social ethical questions related to technology? Whose interest does any particular technology serve? Now, on the one hand, we're saying technology are those things that help us solve problems, right? But might they help us solve problems in ways that serve some people's interests for others. One of the things historically that has always been troubling about new technologies is it puts some people out of work. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to a group of people called the Luddites in a minute. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that. How is the good or value that the technology serves distributed? among all human beings. Uh, we mentioned education as, as an institution, or, or, or schools as educational institutions. Why do we have public schools? Because we think it's important, it's a matter of justice, that everyone have access to knowledge. Everyone be trained how to critically think. If we didn't have public schools, who would get education? Just the people that could afford. And interestingly, we have a public system and a private system. Right? Automobiles. Do you know why Henry Ford is such an important human being? <laughs> He created a faster way to make cars, but because it was faster, what also was it? Cheaper. And because it was cheaper, he was the first person to make a car whose employees could afford to buy that car. Think about, think about the number of products we make where people who are making them aren't paid enough to have access to the thing they're making. But the Model T was considered a huge technological feat because in some ways it, inter it, it addressed this ethical concern. If we have a new technology that serves important interests, don't we want to make sure that there's broad access to that technology, maybe even universal access? How does that technology increase someone's power over others? So who controls who gets access to that technology? Who controls what you can do with the technology? Right? Do, do new technologies make people who already have preponderant power have more power? Like a lot of people worry about surveillance technologies, right? Who uses sur surveillance technologies? Governments and corporations, right? Who already have a lot of power. Does their ability to throw cookies onto your phone <laughs> increase their power? In ways that we should be troubled about? What subversive possibilities exist? 
from a new technology. Subversive in the sense of, okay, so the technology tends to increase someone's power over someone else, tends to create new opportunities for exploitation. Are there ways that those with lesser power can use that technology to undermine uh, the status quo, so to speak, or undermine uh, early early in the emergence of social media and Facebook, uh, people noticed that, uh, what, was it, what was the rebellion 10 or 15 years ago in the Arab world called the, the Arab Spring? And what a lot of people noticed was those protests that were putting a lot of pressure on democratic, uh, on, on authoritarian governments were organized by social media, right? Uh, and so the idea was Hey, people are using this this new technology in ways to challenge authority and to challenge uh, uh, inappropriate authority, to subvert right uh, unjust patterns. Now, I think we're much less uh, much less uh, um, what optimistic about that now because. Turns out Arab Spring didn't amount to much. Turns out that governments are shutting down. Governments are using that technology to promote their own interests in, uh, in particularly uh, troublesome ways. So uh, what, maybe those subversive possibilities aren't as great as we thought. All right, I told you I was going to tell you about the Luddites. This is a term you might hear. We, we use the term Luddite or Luddite, basically to refer to anyone who is uh, against technology, right? who is opposed to technology. And this refers to an actual historical movement in the 19th century where textile workers in England were being replaced by looms. Whose interest did those looms serve? Well, you might say the consumers of textiles, but you might also say the owners of those textile mills who were now able to produce it more cheaply and make a whole lot of money and whose interest was it opposed to? Those of the workers who made those textiles. And they started a movement uh, that has become, uh, was called the, the, the Luddite movement. Any uh, questions, comments, protests, challenges? I don't know about other college professors, but whenever I would pause in my lectures at college, that would be my question. Questions, comments? Protests, and I mean that, right? Part of critical. You, you shouldn't take anything I say and believe it just because I'm saying it. If you heard me say something that you think is just dumb and wrong-headed and misleading and unhelpful, say so. Darn it, we'll talk about it. Question, comments, protests, even. And there's nothing a college professor hates more than saying questions, comments, or protests. So come on, somebody tell me. Something I said made no sense. Something I said was totally unclear and uh, misleading. Did I suggest that? Yeah, and I think I, I used that language because I was talking about authoritarian governments, who I assume a part of what it means, what we mean when we talk about a government as authoritarian, is it doesn't have the people's interests broadly in mind. I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I, well, not, not obviously, but democratic governments are intended to make sure government's interests are the people's interests. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a good, good challenge. So I did not mean to say <laughs> or imply that all government is is opposed to the people's interests. But but I think look, aren't there enough folks that are cynical about our? Do you think our government in the United States, we're a democracy, right? We're the world's greatest democracy. Is what's good for the government always good for us? <laughs> Most of the time. Some of the time. Ooh. 
So we have a lot of cynicism and concern even about our own government and whether the people's interests get served. All right. How am I doing time-wise? What? Okay. So I want to think about self-driving cars, or what are called autonomous vehicles. Uh, I, I learned yesterday that engineers distinguish, uh, I think there's going to be five levels <laughs> uh, of autonomy. Um, level one, a car intervenes slightly, right? Uh, to assist the driver. So what would be an example of that? Lane keeping systems. Uh, so, so the car that I have now for the first time ever, when I wander out of the lane going down Interstate 64, I get a, I think my steering wheel actually vibrates a little bit, right? Uh, now, I, I've got to bring the car back into the lane, but the, um, the uh, car is helping, right? And I think there's even a setting where I can turn it on, and, and not only would the wheel vibrate, but it would actually turn slightly in the right direction. That's a level one uh, uh, technology. Uh, level two, and, and, and the website that I've got up there, uh, their language, features communicate with one another, and more than one can be active simultaneously. Uh, the driver must be stay focused and be prepared to take over, but the car is going to actually do some things on its own. An example of this is what's called a deep cruise control. Uh, so I used to not use cru cruise control on Interstate 64 because I'd set it on 68 or something like that, maybe 75. And somebody would pull it. I would be constantly hitting my brakes. Right, and just it wasn't useful. But now I've got adaptive cruise control. So I set it on 75, let's say, and if a car cuts in front of me, it slows itself down. I don't have to hit the brakes until that car moves out of my way, and then it picks me back up to the speed um, I want to. Right, and if I wander out of the lane, right, the steering wheel is going to twist me back slightly into the lane. Not yet what I would call a self-driving car, but having a car like this has made me go, hmm, this technology is really starting to be here, right? So it gets serious at level three. Level three, the car drives itself under limited conditions. A, le a level three autonomous vehicle will manage speed and steering, negotiate curves, and follow a route. So I'm not just going to type directions into my GPS. I'm going to type directions, and the car is going to take me there. Now, at this lowest level of autonomy, the driver must still be ready and capable of, of taking over. So you can't, you know, this, this level, you can't turn it on and you know, open up your computer. I'm sure some people will be doing that, because I see people riding down the road now uh, with, with books in their steering wheels and crazy stuff. Believe it or not, yesterday, uh, what, no, excuse me, Honda already has such a vehicle uh, available for lease in Japan, and yesterday Mercedes-Benz announced that it will make a level three car available in Nevada, I'm not sure why Nevada, by the end of this year, uh, beating Tesla to the punch, right, who thought they were going to be the first, right? So this stuff is upon us, right? Uh, now, level four, the, the car can absolutely drive itself on a fixed loop. Is that level three, the, the driver still has to be ready to take over, right? So they, they, can't, they can't quit paying attention. But level four, uh, the car could drive itself on a fixed loop or known roads without any human attention required whatsoever. Uh, I think this article speculates those cars might not even have steering wheels and brake pedals. Uh, there are some ride-share ride vehicles already being tested uh, with this technology. And then level five would be the ultimate. The car drives itself under any conditions anywhere. <laughs> right? uh, and at this point, that's just a, a dream. Okay? Now, what are, the, what are the pros? 
Believe it or not, the evidence all suggests that self-driving cars will cut down on accidents and fatalities. Why is that? Because 90% of accidents are driver error, right? Since we'll have less accidents, we'll spend less money repairing cars, repairing the human beings injured in cars, right? Traffic will flow more efficiently because cars will be able to you know, know where each other are and maybe even choose new routes to, to, to beat the traffic, right? Uh, I have to admit, looking at this website uh, uh, yesterday, I hadn't, I hadn't, even, hadn't thought about this before. Self-driving cars will be more accessible. You know, people, as you get to my age, your children start watching you carefully when you drive. When are we going to have to take dad's car away from him? We had to make that decision about uh, my mother and, and my, my wife's mother, right? Took their cars away from them before they went. Self-driving car, they can drive forever. Uh, and then another advantage is reduced stress on the environment. These cars are likely to be electric, but even apart from that, their efficiency in, in, in uh, promoting better traffic flow will mean less stuff uh, going into the environment. Now, there's one profound thing I think is missing here. Can you think of some value of a self-driving car that's missing? And to me, in some respects, it's the most obvious one. What do you mean by convenient? If I'd had a self-driving car coming here today, I'd have continued doing research on self-driving cars to have some new neat things to tell you when I got here but I had to pay attention, careful the whole way. Just think how much more, you know, people on subways read. Now you get in your car to go to wherever you're going, turn it on, pull out a book, pull out a computer, pull out a video game, right? I mean, traveling is going to be more satisfying in a self-driving car because you won't have to give your attention to driving. Now, what are the downsides? Security issue. Somebody's going to try to figure out how to hack those that, that computer technology and make our cars start driving off the side of the road or colliding into each other. How are we going to assure the security? Job losses. Right? It looks like the delivery industry is going to be who most quickly gets into that. All of those UPS and Amazon drivers are going to be replaced. What about cross-country trailer truck drivers, right? Bus drivers uh, in cities, school bus drivers. I wonder if they'll have an automated robot to stand up and say, "Sit down in your seat. Be quiet back there. No hands out the window." Initial costs will be extremely high. Okay, so we're going to have self-driving cars soon. Who's going to have self-driving cars? The rich, right? How long is it going to be until there's a Henry Ford of self-driving cars? <laughs> uh, look, accidents will still happen. Right? Uh, the technology won't be perfect. Cars will still run into each other. People will still get hurt. And, and, and I think, how will we feel about that, right? I mean, think how, how much differently an accident will seem to us when it's not caused by my error or the other person's error, but by some problem in the, in the, in the software. And then this is the one I want us to uh, think a little bit about what, what this particular website called the moral machine uh, 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 dilemma. The inability to make judgments between multiple unfavorable outcomes. So the algorithm that tells your car what to do is going to have to decide between 
plowing into that car stuck in the lane in front of you, putting everybody's life at risk in the car, or swerving to their left and hitting that school bus. So computer engineers are going to have to make decisions like that in terms of telling that car what to do, so to speak. So, Sally, how am I going to get to that? Yep. So, uh, philosophers have long referred to something called the trolley problem, and this is a humorous look at a discussion of the trolley problem. Do you all know this TV show? It's an exciting day. We are going to tackle the trolley problem. Is this the game? I go first. I go blue. There's no... no this is... No. This is a thought experiment first introduced by British philosopher Philip Foote in 1967. You are driving a trolley when the brakes fail, and on the track ahead of you are five workmen that you will run over. Now, you can steer to another track, but on that track is one person you would kill instead of the five. What do you do? Do you know anything about the people? Like, is one of them an ex-boyfriend? Or that snooty girl from Rite Aid who is always silently judging my purchases? It's like, yeah, chicky, a baby move and birth control. I see the irony. Keep a swipe and... You don't know any of the workers. Okay, well, then that's easy. I switch tracks. Kill one person instead of five. But this is hard, because the only trolley I've ever been on is James Franco's ironic trolley. It travels backwards from his penguin grotto to his garage of adult tricycles. Um... One, Good, but there's a lot of other versions of this. Like, what if you knew one of the people? Does that change the equation? Or what if you're not the driver, you're just a bystander? Or let's throw the trolley out altogether. Let's say you're a doctor and you can save five patients, but you have to kill one healthy person and use his organs to do it. But that's not the same thing. Well, why not? It's still choosing to kill one person to save five, isn't it? Michael, you've been kind of quiet. What do you think about all this? Well, obviously the dilemma is clear. How do you kill all six people? So I would dangle a sharp blade out the window to slice the neck of the guy on the other track as we smush our five main guys. Oh, I did the thing again, didn't I? Yeah, Tim more, buddy. People good. People good. Why is that so hard to remember? People... What is it? Good. Good. All right, so the trolley problem. You're driving a trolley. It's about, the brakes fail, you're about to crash into five people and presumably kill them. But you can steer it down a track and kill only one person. What do you do? Are you confident? I mean, everybody agree? Turn it and kill only one person? And, and, and the only reason we might question that is the death of the five would be purely accidental, right? Whereas you have chosen to kill the one. I mean, some might say, now, you got to let nature take its course, so to speak. Right? What about this? What if you're a bystander and you could stop the trolley by grabbing someone and throwing them onto the trolley to save the five? Would you, you wouldn't do that. Rather than steering the trolley down a sidetrack, you are picking someone up and throwing them into the trolley. And you said right away, no, you can't do that. Why? There's a difference between turning it to hit someone rather than grabbing someone. Is there a moral difference? So I ask, is there a moral difference? And he says, sort of, but no, because in either case, you're killing one person to save five. It just requires a different action. You have to pick them up as well. How about if you're not the trolley driver? You're a bystander. But the switch is there and you can throw it. 
do you have the same obligation to throw the sitch as the trolley driver, or does her role as trolley driver give her a responsibility that you don't have as a bystander? As a bystander, we'd say, just get out of the way. Not your problem. What do you think about that? Bystander has the same obligation as the trolley driver or not? The trolley driver, it's, it's, it's her job. The bystander, but on the other hand, it's five dead people or one dead people. Yes, ma'am. Speak louder. So you're saying the bystander... So I think you're making the argument that the bystander has the same obligation to do it. Yeah. But might be held... Res you know, probably wouldn't be held responsible by society if they didn't in the way the trolley driver... Yeah, yeah. But the bystander wouldn't? Yeah. 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 They're, they're workers. They're repairing the track. What's that? Right. That's why these are called thought experiments. They don't... And why I'd say it's not pointless is you might well face a situation in your life or your professional career that has this stark a choice between killing one person or five. In fact, I would argue that the people who put the algorithms in self-driving cars will have to make decisions like this. What about this? Does the anonymity of the people involved matter? Remember the, the Kristen Bell character said, do I know any of these people? Does that matter? It does matter? How does it matter? Give me an example of how it would matter. So if, if uh, your, your name is, Reese is suggesting that if her pregnant mother was the one person who's going to be killed if we divert the track, but she doesn't know the five, then she wouldn't divert the track. She'd kill five anonymous people rather than kill her mother and her little brother or sister. Right? But it's still one. Two. She's made it two. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still two people versus five. What difference does it make whether it's your mother or not? Your mother has a right to live that five anonymous people don't? <laughs> well, okay, let, let's make it more serious. What if the five people on the track are homeless people? And the one person is Jeff Bezos. Do we have time for one more video? Building your online
Your car can't stop in time to avoid the collision, so it needs to make a decision. Go straight and hit the object, swerve left into an SUV, or swerve right into a motorcycle. Should it prioritize your safety by hitting the motorcycle? Minimize danger to others by not swerving, even if it means hitting the large object and sacrificing your life. Round by hitting the SUV, which has a high passenger safety rating. So what should the self-driving car do? If we were driving that boxed-in car in manual mode, whichever way we'd react would be understood as just that, a reaction, not a deliberate decision. It would be an instinctual panicked move with no forethought or malice. But if a programmer were to instruct the car to make the same move, given conditions it may sense in the future, well, that looks more like premeditated homicide. insurance companies? They might have a, a stake and an interest in this. Uh, which, which, one, which choice is going to be the least damage to vehicles? The consumer. So imagine five options, and when you buy your car, you can set it on which of the options. Are you going to, to use the simple one? Am I going to, let, is the car going to go and hit the truck in front of me? Am I going to swerve to hit a motorcycle or am I going to swerve to hit a car? Those choices, I, I get to make the choice. I suspect that what's going to happen is it's going to be determined through some governmental regulatory agency. I think that's what ought to happen. With a lot of public input. Uh, and let me finish up by just raising the final question that got introduced in there. One option is that the car would do nothing. It would go on and hit the object in front of it rather than swerving and injuring someone else. In other words, it would be prioritizing the safety of others over the safety of those driving the car. There's been some interesting surveys where people were asked, what do you think the algorithm should do? And what they'll say is, it should maximize the safety of all considered you know, equally. Which would probably mean it would not prioritize the safety of those in the vehicle. The next question is, would you buy a self-driving car that didn't prioritize your own safety? Because, no, no, no. Right? So think about that. Algorithms simply go for the, great, the least loss without regard to who's lost, or should it prioritize the safety of those in the vehicle? And if it doesn't prioritize the safety of those in the vehicle, will you buy it? Question? <laughs> yeah. He would know to swerve to hitting the, uh, yeah, mm, uh, I'm not a computer engineer, <laughs> uh, but I think you raise an interesting, I mean, I'm introducing you to the thinking about this at the simplest possible level, but it's a complicated issue because it's not just how the individual car.
anywhere we are, if we have to evacuate for fire purposes, which is of course what that was, um, you want to get out of the road. You don't want to be standing on any pavement because guess where the fire trucks are going to come. So anytime we're anywhere like this and you handled it beautifully, you want to go as far into the grass away from the building as you, you know, feasibly can safely. And you guys did well when we started moving people. So thank you for that. So I want you to talk with your group mates for a minute and answer this question. There will be no more information given to you. That's all you've got is the picture. Discuss. is the fence is what we're talking about moving or not moving the fence is the question to move the fence or not move the fence is the question Okay, wind up that conversation by a show of hands. And there's no, no judgment on any of this. Who wants to move the fence? Who wants to not move the fence? Who needs more information? Okay. I never use the right arrows. It's that front and back thing. I'm directionally challenged. This is a visual example of Chesterson's fence. What is that? I didn't know either until a couple of days ago. Chesterson says, there exists in such a case a certain institution or law, let us say for the sake of simplicity, a fence or a gate erected across a road. The more modern type of reformer goes gaily up to it and says, I don't see the use of this, let us clear it away. To which the more intelligent type of reformer will do well to answer, if you don't see the use of it, I certainly won't let you clear it away. Go away and think. Then, when you can come back and tell me what use you do see of it, I may allow you to destroy it. The brain just trying to process that? Yes? So the end result of Chesterton's fence theory is you need to understand it before you try to remove it. You walk into a situation, you see something you want to, it's in your way, it's inconvenient, it's whatever, and you're like, that can be done with. Till it's done with, and you don't know what consequences are going to be because you've removed that lock 
defense institution whatever so it is basically saying go back and think look at the whole thing the pros the cons the whole topic before you make a decision to reform to move to keep to whatever raise your hand if that sort of makes sense now I'll tell you the story of the picture it's a real picture a guy posted it on reddit don't recommend that but that's where I found it um, so that being said he lives locally where that field is and about months prior to that picture the grass was chest high and the local folks had started walking through that field to get to the other side to get wherever in that town and the owner of the field took action to that practice so the owner of the field put up a fence on the left side of that path and what we did not see was there were fences on the other side of the field and then somebody cut the grass they cut the grass the grass is gone so thereby the only thing still remaining is the fences that you see did it serve a purpose when the grass was this high can we still see that purpose not at the time we couldn't see it but there was a purpose for it and then there was a whole argument about what should they move them now that the grass has been cut or let the grass that wasn't important but it truly is not usually a fence that we run into these problems with in life it's a rule or a law or maybe a wall in a house somewhere that you think you want to tear down and then it's a weight bearing wall and you tear the wall down and the whole house goes <laughs> okay so this is why we want you to do this paper this semester we want you to be able to learn how to look at a topic that you may have a guttural reaction to but be able to stop that and say wait let me go think about it let me go research it let me go look at it deeper and then be able to make an informed choice at that time and he does not say Chesterton does not say don't do anything he says go learn about it and then we can talk about whether or not we need to change it can you feel that difference he's saying learn about it and then we can talk about whether or not we need to change it okay all right how many of you've been through the website for this project with your teacher okay we're in a little bit of a hurry because we obviously had a fire drill so I'm not going to do that right now miss um, Carr you ready to talk details after we finish this when I get the thumbs up I will let you know what's next but right now here is Miss Carr good morning everybody how y'all doing today feeling good everybody getting hungry
Okay, while we're getting this pulled up, I have a quick, a few quick questions for you. All right, first of all, who can tell me what is bias? What does bias mean? What? Go ahead. Right here. Yes. And so, so you're taking a side and something in favor of something else. Can anybody have a different definition? Yes. Okay, pre-existing ideas about a topic, yes. When your opinions change your definition of something, all of those are really good. So here's a question for you all, another question. Uh, everything is written from somebody's point of view. You guys know that, right? So can we, what's the difference between bias and reliability? If, you thought, if we're talking about sources, that's what I'm getting at, sources. What's the difference between a reliable source and a bias source. What is a re reliability? What does a reliability mean in terms of the sources? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Now, here's my next question. Can you get information, valuable information, from a biased source? Yeah. Even though you're telling me, even though it's one-sided, you can still, you think you can still get valuable information. Okay. All right. So what we need to do when we th we're talking about this project is most of you guys are going to do your research through internet. So we have to make sure that you're, you're thinking about the choices for your sources. So if you're researching something on a topic and you're trying to find the pros and the cons, you have to make sure that you're looking at the source to see if there's, in, what, what is the purpose of the source? If there's a purpose, if the purpose is to make you buy something, would you think that would be a good source? No, probably not. So, all right, this is the, this is the official American Heritage Dec uh, Dictionary definition. A preference or an inclination, especially one that inhibits impartial judgment. What does impartial judgment mean? What does that mean? Impartial, what? What? You have no bias, okay. How do you know if a historical source is biased? Can we skip this? Do we have time? I oh, can't remember. Skip it. We can go. I got it. Okay. These are things that you look for when you're trying to figure out if a source is reliable. These are the things that you should look for. Is the purpose of the source to persuade you? Is the purpose of the source to inform you? Is the purpose of the source to entertain you? Or is the purpose of the source to sell you something? Which one of those things, which letter do you think is probably the best option for you in terms of doing your research? Oh my gosh, y'all are so smart. Yes, it's the I. All right, so I have two images here. Y'all familiar with the Boston Massacre? All right, so for those of you that are not, Boston Massacre happens during uh, pre-revolution. Um, and so we're going to look at this source. All right, so this is done by Alonzo Chapel Chappelle in 1873. Did a lot, Mr. Chapel, did he do that? Was he on the scene? How do we know? Because of the date. The date tells us that it's after the fact. Okay, and so what do you see in the picture? I'm going to pick on people. Tell me something you see in the picture. Okay, so we have these people over here we're assuming are the British people, right? And then we have probably the colonists over here, okay? Next person I'm going to pick on is going to be you, young lady. Um, who looks like they're at fault here? No, who, who's, 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 who's at fault? Who's, who, who are the bad guys in the picture? My girl just said they all have guns, so it doesn't look like anybody's really the bad guy. This looks like an equal fight, correct? All right. So, we do see people down here, but it, does, it looks like both sides have weapons. Now, so you're telling me even though it's 1873, we could still use, is this, this would be a reliable source, you think, you think even though it's 1873? 
I, I have a no, why not? Okay, so he says it's too old, it's out of date. Does anybody disagree with him? Who disagrees? Why do you disagree? Okay, we're not going to find a whole lot of new information about something that happened that long ago. Okay, and so um, let me ask this question. Does this picture indicate any bias? I have a yes as a no. Somebody with a yes, tell me where you see the bias. Yes. Okay. All right. Any no's? Any no's or bias? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay, very good. One, things that I, one of the things that I want you guys to think about is this. I don't want you to ever shy away from the fact that this is 1873 and think that this is not a good source. Because Mr. Mr. Alonzo, what he's had the opportunity to do is he's had an opportunity to look at both sides and figure out, let me, let me take both sides of this event, both sides of the story, and I'm going to paint a picture that shows both sides instead of just one. All right, you ready for this? All right. Does anybody know who the uh, who the artist is? Anybody know? Come on, my history boss. Where where are you? Yes. Woo! Paul Revere, right here. Girl got it, right here. Ding 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 ding. You got it. It's exactly right. Which side was Paul Revere on? He's on the colonist side, right? How is this picture different from the previous one? That's Lillian. Okay, so th these gr this group right here looks completely, completely innocent. The previous picture showed them not that innocent. These people look like they're just an open fire, open. This guy right here, I think his name is Prescott, Captain Prescott. This looks like he's the man in charge, and he's the one that's given the command for them to fire. Woo, what you got right here? You had a question? You have a question? You're stretching. Exactly. So that's a great, great point. It's going to lead me to my next thing. So the purpose. Think about the purpose of the source. If Paul Revere draws this, well, I didn't really draw it, but if he makes this engraving and he actually titles it The Bloody Massacre, what is his purpose of doing this? What did you just say so I can repeat it for them? What, what was his purpose? Yes, if you're sitting on the fence and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know whether I should, I don't know whether I should be with this group of crazy people that are trying to get their independence or whether I should just kind of lay low and hang out and see what happens, this might persuade some people to get off the fence, right? Because clearly these people are bad people. All right, one of the things that uh, I'll give you a quick little story. One of the things that my, uh, my juniors are doing, I teach U.S. history also, and one of the things that I have just recently learned is that there's another really cool engraving, and it's of a tarring and feathering of a tax collector in Boston. It's called the tarring and feathering of the excise man, and excise man is the tax man. And so my students had a hard time figuring out people that were tarring and feathering the tax man were actually patriots. And it's very, it was very, very interesting to me to think 
that we all, almost everyone in this room, has been conditioned, we've been, we've been taught and conditioned to think that the Patriots were good and the Patriots were bad. So when you see this, it's like, it's like a complete opposite of this. When you see this, this picture of these guys tarring and feathering that poor tax man, you're like, holy crap, they're tarring and feathering the man. But we, it's hard to think about that because we only, we, we've been taught that these people are good and these people are bad. Okay, other things to consider when you're looking at sources. Is it presented in a fair and objective manner? Has some of the information been left out? Can the facts be verified by another source? And I think we talked about this in first semester. You guys need to always make sure that you look at your websites, where you're getting your information from, and see if you can figure out who the author is. What are their credentials? Are they Joe Smo from Idaho that just likes talking about Boston Massacre? Or are they a professor at a college who's done research on the matter? What is the tone of the language used and is it free of emotion arousing words? Are the pictures and photos that may arouse emotion, get you, get you, get you mad, get you happy? Is the appearance of the website appealing and colorful with lots of graphics, animation, or celebrities trying to grab your attention? More than likely, they're trying to sell you something. Does the website contain advertising? All right, credibility. When you're looking at websites, these are things you need to think about. What types of websites are they? Dot com is commerce. What does commerce mean? Money, trade, exactly. ORG is nonprofit. Net is network. EDU is education. And GOV, of course, is government. Here's your checklist. I'm not going to read that to you. Maybe it is. These are things to look for. Does it have an author? How recently has it been updated? Especially the topics that you guys are going to be covering for your semester project, those are all things that are modern day things. So you need to make sure that you pay attention to the dates because if you're talking about uh, the, uh, the pros and cons of a drone and you're using a website from 1975, that probably is not going to be very good information. Uh, is it government or EDU? Can you contact the author if you had a question? What is the purpose of it? Bias? Internal citations and bibliography. You know, we talked about early on the uh, talking about Wikipedia, right? When is it okay to use Wikipedia? Wrong. The man in the front said never, and I said wrong. What? Who had an answer over here? What you got? What'd you have? When's it okay to use Wikipedia? Yes. And, the, and what do you use it for in the very beginning? Correct. If you don't know what the Hello Kitty fracking is, then that's a good place to start. Wikipedia is a good place to start because you're getting some basic, basic foundation information on whatever your technology is, and then from there you can move forward. Also, never forget, most Wikipedia sites have a ton of, ton of places that you can go and do additional research. It, they usually tell you where they got their information from. Amateur design, clickbait. Okay, I'm, gonna do, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do all of these. These websites are designed to show you that they don't have to look like, websites don't have to look like they're done by amateurs to make to, to, to be real. Ooh. This is one of my favorites. Well, it was. Past tense. So that was a website, I'll tell you what it was. It was a website, it was called Dog Island. And it was basically a place that you could send your dog for vacation. And so, of course, it's fake. Let's see if this one works. If this is a no, I'm going to quit. OK, this one, this one we learned about very early in our days when we started off in government school. We were at UVA. And this is a, a website for a hospital. And one of the pictures on the, on the main page of the hospital was a pregnant man. All right, hey, one out of five works. That's good. This is all about explorers. Look, website looks good, doesn't it? I got that one negative person in the room. 
All right, let's go to uh, everybody's favorite, Christopher Columbus. What's the first line say? Wait, there's more. Jake, Jake, English circumnavigate. He's born in New Jersey. Who knew that? He learned about the ocean on the Jersey Shore. I bet if you keep reading, he, he was on a reality TV show too. No, about that. Anyway, my whole point of this is just make sure you check your stuff out. It, this looks professional. But the whole point is n not everything professional is correct. So just make sure you check your... Uh, Check your, check your sources. Just what you said, people messing with people. And your teachers found those and said, let's mess with some students. Let's, let's show them what it means to have a, a nice website that's been created, but it's filled with inaccurate, awful information, so they don't make that same mistake. So good luck on your projects. Good luck on your research. Hopefully lunch will be soon. All right, it's before you depart. Look under the seats for those little pieces of paper and that kind of thing that has fallen out of your book bag or off of your, the napkins off the plate or whatever. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. So we are going to take a few moments in all the confusion with fire drills and whatnot, we've missed something. So we're gonna go back and grab that to be sure you're 100% on that place. I'm gonna start you on the website and Ms. Carr is gonna talk some more details about the actual history project because I taught math. That being said, what I want you to notice about the website right now will help you next year. This big teal button in the middle changes from season to season depending on what we have going on and right now it says something about what? courses and course scheduling. So when you're a sophomore, we'll be coming to talk to you more about it, but this is where the big button is going to be if you want to look into it at that time or before that, because that'll stay that way for how much longer? Another couple of weeks, it'll be this button. Since I started that can of worms, if you go to students and you go down to course scheduling, you can also get there that way if you want to look at it and that big blue button is not available in that fashion. But what I hope you already know is from the students tab, you have a course resources link. And then you can come to projects. And of course, you all are in your second semester with World and the Persuasive Essays. As you hopefully already know, this left-hand menu is going to give you a lot of information. The overview and the dates you should already know about. Sorry, the internet's a little slow in here. We appreciate it, though. That one, that kickoff info, I just added it this morning. That has a recording of everything that's been done here today with links to the presentation that you'll see. So if you missed something or you wanted to hear something Dr. Penholler or a teacher said again, you can go back and watch the whole recording. Everybody say thank you. Thank you. She does amazing things to make all of our life easier, so please always share that. The next link, of course, is the project topics, literally scenario by scenario. And you should be reasonably acquainted with this by now. If not, get on it. The paper I'm not going to speak to because I won't be grading it, and that would be a little bit crazy for me to try to do that for you. You should already have your assignments and know who's in your groups. Okay. Now, from here, you're going to, from today's kickoff, go and write your own paper, and then you will be working at some point in time, four or six weeks, I don't know the exact time frame, 
will tell you whether you are going to defend the pro side of this argument or the con side of this argument. So you need to have that Chesterton's fence idea and look at both sides of everything until you're notified otherwise. Okay? We'll look at group presentation guidelines in another way or today if we have time. But right now I'm going to let Ms. Carr go over the nuts and bolts of what your teachers are going to expect of each of you. I'm back. Okay, so first of all, you already know, you have your topics and you already know that you have to do the pros and cons, correct? Yes. Okay. Why do we make you do that? Why do you have to do both? So what? Uh, so you can have a counter argument so you know what the other side, what, what are the pros and what are the cons. Now, here's the, here are the, the, the details. You're, so, you're, you're going to have five academic sources. Academic sources. What does that mean? Academic sources. I think the same thing was written on your project website for first semester. Academic sources, what does that mean? Yeah, so sorry. A dot, a dot edu, a dot gov. Are you allowed to use things that don't have those? You sure? Listen, I, th this is, this is I, I'm speaking for, for me, but if you find an awesome website that's not an edu and a, not a gov, and you can tell that it was not made for to sell you something, make Columbus great again, then check with your teacher. Check with your teacher. Because they should be able to look at it and say, yeah, there's some good information up here. So, uh, five academic sources, notes document. Look, I'm old school. I'm an old girl. I, my, I've already told my kids this. This is so much easier. I had to go with paper into a library and sit on the floor and open up a book and take notes on it. This is so much easier. Use your notes document. That's the place where you take notes. You look at the, you look at the website and you jot down important information. And then you use that notes document to help you write your paper. Rough draft. Rough draft must be a thousand words. Should be close to the final draft. Any questions on that? Rough draft, first draft. Rough draft, first draft, whichever you want to call it. In-text citations, MLA format. That means that you're going to, what, what's the purpose of an in-text citation? What's that purpose? Come on, y'all know, y'all did them in first semester? I'm not Dr. Penhaller, I know what you did first semester. What's the purpose of an in-text citation? Come on, come on, tell, tell, help a girl out. Correct, so I can look at it, your paper and I can say, oh, oh, Carr 57, oh, that came from that great author, Stacy Carr, and she wrote this really cool book and I bet that's a really good source. I'm Stacy, by the way. So, in-text citations, yes. That's where you give credit for where you're getting your sources from. And then, if you have something on your works cited page, that means you must have an in-text citation in your paper. Final requirements. Introduction, introductory paragraph. What comes at the end of the introductory paragraph? Oh, yes, thesis statement, ding, ding, good job. Final paper, two arguments for each side. What does that mean? You want to go? You want to try? Come on. Come on. I'm going to pick on two arguments. What does that mean? Let me go. Oh, okay. Thank you, volunteer, so I didn't have to draft somebody. What does it mean? Correct. Two pro reasons and two con reasons. That's exactly right. Uh, Works cited page, MLA format, submitted to Google Classroom, no later than 4 o'clock on the deadline. I'm good on that. I'm good on that. Okay, stop right there. Paper organization. Look, y'all, this is like the skeleton. This is like the outline. This is the outline for the outline. If you guys would just use this paper organization right here, this tells you exactly how to organize your paper. Exactly how to organize your paper. All right, keep rolling. Wait, sorry, go back down. Go back down. Okay. Yeah. So listen, in the introductory paragraph, this is what I tell my kids about establishing time and place. You want to give the reader some ideas of what the heck's going on. So if you're talking about the, uh, the pros and cons of drones, because I used that earlier, you need to give the reader some sort of idea about what the heck is a drone? When were they invented? Who invented them? What were they invented for? 
That's establishing time and place and getting your reader where they need to be. Okay, sounds I'm good. Conclusion. Here's a question. Should you ever have an in-text citation in your conclusion? No. Who said no? Why not? Ding, 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 ding. Shouldn't be introducing any new information in your conclusion. What is the exception to the rule? There is an exception. There's exceptions to every rule. What is it? Oh, quote it is. That's right. If you have a direct quote, you've got to do an in-text citation, people. Okay, mechanics, thousand words, blah. I'm, I'm good there. You're good. Is that it? Yeah. Uh, anything else on this? Can we cover anything else? Anybody else? Questions? Does anybody have any questions? You have all your teachers right here, so this is a great time to ask a question. Okay. What's the next thing? Yes, what you got? Well, you, you, let me make sure I'm hearing your question. You want to know why you have to use your specific BRVGS notes document? I mean, I don't think there's anything special about that notes document. I think it's just a document, right? I don't think there's anything special about it, is it? It's just, it's just how it's organized. If you want to I, ask your teacher, if you want to create your own Google Doc, I think you can probably have at it. Just make sure you title that thing and name that thing the right way. Wow. So the. I know y'all can't imagine that. Y'all, I know no one in this room does. Hey, listen, what's an annotated bibliography? Anybody know what an annotated bibliography is? I guarantee dog on you, you'll do those in, col in college. What is it, Kenny? Correct. So basically, you find your sources, and you're like, okay, what is this source on uh, on nuclear energy? This is talking about. Uh, um, nuclear energy in the 22nd cent for 21st century. Can you call me? So, yeah, and so basically you summarize what that source is about. Uh, and it's a good way for you just to get a general list, um, just to get some idea as to what, what sources are out there and what's in the sources. Okay. That's your notes document right there. What's next? I mean, sure. I've been on this mic a long time. Miss Carr really likes talking on the microphone, as you can tell. She should have been a talk show host. <laughs> yeah. You got to be careful who you give a microphone to. Um, so, where's the best place to do your research in a place that has tons of academically peer reviewed articles? and Blue Ridge pays for you to have access to. Oh, that was disappointing. Um, so some of you did say the databases. So under course resources on this very first page, the very first link, the EBSCO research databases. Uh, Blue Ridge pays quite a bit of money for you guys to have access to this. Um, it's a small part of what, like, uh, next year we will take you to the UVA library to research in their databases. Ours is not as extensive as theirs, but it's still really good with a couple millions of articles. Um, definitely go through how to log in. It, you have to be very specific because it gets testy with school-issued computers trying to even using our Blue Ridge accounts. Um, so really review the document I have linked there on how to access it with your Blue Ridge account. Um, and you might want to look over some of the basic and advanced searching techniques so that you can kind of hone in on articles that will actually help you. Everything you find in there counts as a peer-reviewed scholarly article. 
So I would recommend, if you're thinking about like what Ms. Carr was talking about with bias and things like that, you really don't have to worry about it that much if you're pulling it from our database. Um, if you or your class would like uh, me to come in and really walk you through how to search it and fine tune it to find the articles you need, or if you yourself are just having trouble and would like me to help you um, search your topic or find something specific that you're looking for, I'm more than happy to help. If you hit something that doesn't give you the full article and has like a paywall, if you send me the citation for it, I might be able to find it through our contacts at UVA. Um, so don't procrastinate on this though. If I have 43 people email me the day before this is due, needing help with sources, I probably won't be able to help you. But if you jump on this early, I am happy to help you find what you need. Um, but definitely look at that. One of the other databases we do uh, pay for is the Points of View database. I can't stress strongly enough how much you should look at this one. Um, when you search a topic, it will give you uh, points, art, articles that make points and counterpoints about your topic, which is just another word for pro and con. Um, so if your topic is in there, that is a really good place to start because they kind of do a lot of the work for you. Um, but like I said again, I am happy to come into your class either through Google Meet or in person or just work with you one on one to find your sources. Please don't sit and wait on this. I know most of you are going to procrastinate. Every single senior says it at the end of their presentation that they wish they hadn't procrastinated. Um, but get in the habit now of biting little chunks off now, doing small parts of this a little bit every day or every couple days, and then this project will be super easy. And you won't be writing a thousand page paper the night before it's due. Um, and note that due, due dates are always at 4 p.m. So if it's due on February 7th, you do not have until 11.59 p.m. You have until 4 p.m. And if you didn't have success, that's an even bigger reason to contact me, and I will help you. Um, please, I, the last thing we want is for you guys to be sitting somewhere stressed out because you can't find what you need. Um, contact me early and often. Even if you contact me and say, I can't find anything, and you keep working on it, and you find a ton of stuff, and then you email me back, that's great. Um, but a lot of times it comes down to knowing how to put in your search terms or your search parameters to find what you're really looking for. Hello, <laughs> I'm Ms. Goodwin. I serve pizza and I'm the online learning coordinator. <laughs> um, I did, yeah. Um, today, uh, I just want to talk to you about teamwork real quick. And let me get my file here. All right, so teamwork. You're, you're in teams already. You know who's in your team. Uh, can you hear me okay in the back? Yes, okay. You've got a small group, and you know, you, you know that you're going to have to work with these people in your group. And so teamwork in general sometimes gets a bad rap, but we want to talk about how to look at it in a positive way. Because teamwork's really everywhere. You have to be a team at school, but you're likely you have teams at home, and you might be on teams 
uh, that you play sports on or that um, maybe you're in a club that has teams. So they're really everywhere and this skill, learning to work in teams, is a lifelong skill. So while you're learning all the content that your teachers are teaching you through this activity, part of what you're learning is how to work in a team. Um, what made me think about, um, when I started thinking about this, I thought, oh, well, the Super Bowl's coming up. This is a perfect example of teamwork. And, you know, if you think about a football team, that's a great idea to think about, like, well, the quarterback doesn't win the game, do they? They have to have all different kinds of people on their team. There might not even be people that you see that make up their team. So it might not just be people on the field that make up a team. It might be people on the sidelines. It might be people in, in offices. There's all kinds of roles that make up a team. And so working on a team, um, you have to be able to, to motivate your team members. And so you have to um, know that sometimes that is motivating for people to, to be able to work on a team. Some people less likely. Um, and sometimes when you're on a team, there might be somebody on your team that thinks of something that you might not think of. And so we want to talk about some of those things today too. So we're going to come up with a task and do this quick little uh, activity. And I'm going to show you some uh, attributes of teammates here in a minute. And I want you in your head, um, well, not in your head, you're sitting in groups. So like everybody in this first group right here, raise your hand. This first group. Is it these two rows? Okay. The whole row? Okay. So you're going to work in your team to do what I'm getting ready to explain. Okay. We're going to do the same thing twice. Um, so you're, as a team, you're going to pick and you're going to talk as a teammate, a team, five people that you would choose to be on your team. And you want to make sure that you get the best team picked as possible. Okay? Think about it that way. All right. So the characteristics are coming up, and you're going to decide on just five. So look at your teammates. You should have one person on your team that has a computer. Does any teams that still need a computer? Okay. So we're going to get to you in just a second. You don't need the computer for the first part of this activity. So don't sweat it if your team is still waiting on a computer. We only need the computer for the second part of the activity. All right. So teams, are you ready? You're going to pick out of this list what you think are the top five characteristics or attributes that would make the best team. Okay? So I'm going to give you three minutes. And I'm going to start the timer up here. And when the timer goes off, I want your team to have your five. Any questions? You can write yours down. If you have a piece of paper, just jot down the five that your team comes up with. What did you say? Which group? Uh, there was one back there. It's the only one I saw. Which group needed a computer still? Raise your hand and wave at me if your group still needs a laptop. All right. You need a laptop? Oh. Anyone else need a laptop? Wave at me if you need a laptop. One in the back. Are you waving at me right here? One more wave. <laughs> Is your hand up? 
All right, put it up so you beat it. We need one more right here, if you have it. Are you guys all one team? You're working as a team. You're working as a team based on your topic to you. The, your topic team is the team that you're working in right now. You need a computer? All right, we need one more. Do you have more? Okay. All right. <laughs> You'll just have to do it. You'll have to just do it without a computer. <laughs> All right, wrap it up. If you don't have your five as a group, you're in your team, just jot it down on a piece of paper so you have an idea of what your team thinks. Time's up. <laughs> All right. As a team. But wait, things change. I'm going to tell you something. And, and I want you to take the same team that you're working in, so your group, I should say, by subject of what you've been assigned, that group. You guys picked your five. I'm going to show you a situation. I'm going to tell you about a situation, and I want you to imagine your, your group is now in this situation. Okay? Imagine your search and rescue. You are a search and rescue team, and you have arrived at a campground by the beach where a young child has gone missing. It's almost evening, and a search is being organized to find the child before nightfall. All the equipment's ready. The track leading away from the beachside camp is narrow, and the terrain is rough and rugged. The nearby cliffs are reported to be unstable. Only a small group of five people will be able to set off in the initial search party. The rest will have to stay behind and join in the search in the morning if the child has not been found. Too many people may dislodge large boulders from the cliff face or will get in each other's way on the small track. Okay, so knowing all of this, your mission. I want you to work again in your group and decide if you want to make any changes to that list that you just came up with. And then I want you to be ready to explain it if you make changes. Wait a minute. I need your attention still. Okay, this is the same table that I showed you before. So, once you, your team comes up with the new list and, and you see, we, do we want to make any changes knowing what we know now, okay, I want you to go to that tiny URL and I want you to enter your new team picks of what you would pick knowing what you know now. That's why you have the computer. Any questions? Guess how many minutes you have? Three minutes.
All right, you're about halfway through. You have a minute and a half left. All right, 30 seconds. Try to get your submissions in. 30 seconds. All right, time's up. Eyes up here, please. If you're still submitting, go ahead and submit. And I want to look at the survey results with you so that we can see what the most popular choices were. Okay, let's see if we can zoom this in. There we go. That looks a little bit better, but let's look at what the top four characteristics were according to what you guys changed from what you originally thought. Loves to be in charge, but can't... Do you remember what that one was? Loves to be in charge, but can't... Can't work with others? Can. All right, uh, next up... They have good ideas to share. So that was 88%. That's pretty high. Um, they're a great doer. They're very practical. The fourth one, they're very practical. Um, all four of those kind of have to do with doing. All right, so those are the kind of people that you want when you have this task. Uh, raise your hand if you picked something much different than this before you knew what the task was. Did anybody have much different answers? I see a couple hands. Or were they about the same? Raise your hand if yours were a lot different. Not much different. All right. Well, what I want to... Let me get out of this. All right. What I want to point out about teams is that everybody usually brings something to the table. So when you have a team, you're going to have all kinds of different people. And you probably have already picked up on that today, sitting here today in your, in your team for this project you're getting ready to do. So remember that everybody on your team might not be the same, and it's most likely you don't want everybody on your team to be the same because everybody would give you the same suggestions. Everybody would have the same strengths. So that's a good thing to remember when, you, when you're starting on this project. And remember that when you're watching the football uh, game at, uh, at this weekend. Any football fans interested in the game this weekend? Well, I'm not saying. <laughs> All right. Thanks for your attention.
All right, hang in. There's just literally two more minutes of information that I want to make sure we give you. All right. Eventually, oh, it's up there. Great. So I think this is actually in this auditorium, but that's beside the point. What I want you to notice is the attire. The attire is basically very neutral. The attention is drawn to the presenters' faces, okay? And I want you to know we have revised the attire expectations for Blue Ridge this year, and I'm going to share them with you on the next slide, just so you know now, okay? You want to be in business casual, and that can mean a lot of things, but basically neat pants or skirt, skirts at the knee level or longer, a collared shirt or a business style shirt, and again, that's pretty much, you can look those things up and you know basically what's expected, or a business style dress, knee length or longer. And basically those things will put the attention to you as the presenter and not to any part of the attire you're wearing. Clean shoes, please. When you are a senior, we're gonna ask that you have a blazer, a jacket, or a sweater over top of that business style shirt. It just will look more professional at that level and that will be your senior presentation where you've been doing a lot of things through business organizations. And last but not least, the ties are optional all the time, okay? So when you come to your final presentation for world history, you need to be sure you're paying attention to all of these bullets. And this was supposed to be the end of a presentation on public speaking, but we have run out of time. But the big thing there I'm going to add is no gum. Please don't chew gum while you're trying to speak to people. Um, that, of course, has its disadvantages and distractions. What questions do any of you have in the moment? Yes. The question was about hats, and during the presentation, the answer is probably going to be no. In an audience like this, that can be different, but when you're presenting, generally, if you think business office, business casual, typically hats are not going to be something that's welcome in that moment. literally the idea of comfortable in your skin and or whatever you're wearing that day. So I want to thank you all for being so respectful and attentive today. The silence in the room at the appropriate times was greatly noticed and appreciated. We are going to let you get with your um, teachers at this moment. We're going to ask you to hold for a second because Orange does need to leave first. So if Orange County can gather, then they will depart and then you can go where you need to go. Thank you.